it's very great to talk to you again. I had such a fun time talking to you when I was in Denmark. This is great to visit with you again. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy you want to do it because since we talked last time, something happened around the colonel, even if he had been dead for many years. You mean the movie? Yes, exactly. The movie with Tom Hanks. It's like you had a special relationship with this Tom Hanks in some way regarding the colonel because you had an interview with Tom many, many years ago. Yes, I had an interview with him at the early part of the 2000s. I was interviewing him about Melissa Etheridge. They were friends. They hung out together in Hollywood, particularly in their early years of their career. And uh, I was working on The Colonel at that time, and I had run out of money. This, that book, my, my book on The Colonel, uh, was so expensive to research, and uh, I had run out of money. And so I was thinking that if I could get a film deal then I would have the money to continue the research and then to sit and write it for a year. So I knew that he had done that film call, That Thing You Do, and he had a production company. So I hit him up at the end of the interview, something I would never ordinarily do, but I was, I was desperate to find the money to sustain this book. So I hit him up to produce a, a film out of, the, uh, out of my research about the colonel. And uh, I guess I didn't hit him really hard on it, but uh, uh, certainly he knew what I meant. And he knew quite a bit about the colonel. And uh, that became interesting all these years later, because when he was promoting the film, he, he claimed not to have known what the colonel looked like or much about him. So uh, that wasn't precisely true. But, you know, people tell these little white lies in, in promoting a project. I don't hold it against him. And and I'm not mad. My, my father ended up borrowing money against our family home for me to finish that book. And uh, what an extraordinary um, uh, declaration of love and belief in the project my father had. And uh, I think of him every day when I think about this book and good old Colonel Parker. Yeah, and now the book is out again. It has been printed again, a new foreword in it also. It's an afterword, actually. It's, it's an amazing document that our mutual friend, Tony Stutchberry found. You know, when I was researching my book, it was the late 90s and very early 2000s. Like it came out in 2003 originally. And and so much uh, of the research is now available online, but it wasn't then, particularly ancient documents. And Tony Stutchberry was kind of dialing around the web uh, last year, and he found an amazing Holland America document, uh, which shows that the colonel was deported from the United States um, as soon as he got here, I think. That's what, that's what we think, and that's what Holland America thinks. Probably he was a stowaway. This was on one of his early visits before he came over uh, and eventually stayed. Um, but he made multiple trips to America, two or three. Uh, but yes, to actually see his name on there and the address in, in uh, Rotterdam, which was his uncle's address. He was living with his uncle when he came over. Um, to actually see that and then to see the, the Dutch about deportation is, is quite something. I had to get Holland America to verify it because I was terrified I was <laughs> not interpreting it correctly. But that is what it says. And that is really astonishing to see. And, and I, I tell that story in the afterward and then I reproduce the document as well for you to see. How come he stayed then? Well, how come he stayed? He... Yeah. You know, my guess, this was in March of 1926. And early, earlier research done by Dirk Vellinga had showed that he came over in March of 26 and stayed for a while and went home in 1927. So I think what happened with this particular situation that the document shows is that he was sent back from New York. This is a trip, a Holland America ship from New York to Rotterdam. So probably he came over on that. He was discovered as a stowaway. And then they sent him back before he was able to leave the ship. And then the first time it stopped somewhere, he probably <laughs> got on another ship and came back. That would be so in keeping with his personality. He was a wise man. <laughs> oh, you know, always trying to put the con over on somebody. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's going to be an interesting man we are going to talk about uh, today. But uh, when did you first... Uh, 
find out about the name Colonel Tom Parker? When did you uh, found more interest in the manager of Elvis Presley? Because I think Elvis came first, right? Well, you know, actually, a very long time ago, when I was a child, when Elvis first came on the national scene, I saw a photograph of the colonel handing out pictures of Elvis to little girls who looked exactly like me. I was six years old. And I kind of inserted myself into this photograph. They were little blonde girls. Of course, I was blonde. And it, somehow I just was right there in that scene. I was so in love with Elvis and er just Elvis crazy. And, and in my mind, I just I was there. And so as, as time went on, I, I thought I've got to meet Colonel Parker. I've got, even before I started writing about Elvis uh, to the extent, you know, I've, I've done four Elvis Presley books. Uh, and so the opportunity came when I was working on uh, my book with Marty Lacker and Billy Smith and Lamar Fike, the Memphis Mafia book. And I, I have done a little book with Alan Fortas of Elvis's Entourage. Most people don't know about this book. It's called Elvis from Memphis to Hollywood. And originally I just ghost wrote it. I, my name isn't on it, I, just Alan's. But then he died three weeks after it came out. And when it, the book was republished sometime later, his son said, well, you know, you should put your name on it so somebody can talk about this book. I don't want my father to be forgotten. So when, when I was doing this book with Alan, he was very ill with kidney cancer and the Colonel would call him um, on Sunday afternoons. And I was often there when the Colonel called. And one day I asked Alan to ask him to sign a photo for me. So uh, years later when I was doing the mafia book, um, I told those guys it would really be a coup to get the Colonel to talk to, to me about what had happened when the state of Tennessee forced the estate of Elvis Presley to cut ties with him. So I got on a plane. I'd never been to Las Vegas before. <laughs> Somehow Las Vegas didn't appeal to me. So I'd never been there. And, and I went and went looking for Colonel Parker and found him. And uh, having uh, lunch in the or breakfast in the coffee shop at the Hilton and went over and introduced myself and reminded him that I was Alan's friend and had written his book. And he had signed a photo for me. And that that kind of broke the ice. And he invited me to sit down and and that was my first of three visits with him from 1992 through 1994. And before I ask the obvious question, I would just say it's a, li it's a little bit um, in a good way that he actually kept contact with Alan when he was sick. You know, it shows something good about the colonel if he called him just to say hello and have a talk. Yes. And, you know, he reminded me, the colonel told me that uh, he called Alan 79 times when he was ill. Gosh, you know, I don't know. And that seems like an awful lot, but it sounds like he kept track and he was a meticulous record keeper. So that's quite possible. Uh, I remember uh, telling that to Lamar and he said he must have had life insurance on him. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but uh, he did. He did call him a lot. And Alan was very fond of him. Yeah. Um, and uh, what was your uh, first impression of the colonel when you met him uh, yourself? Well, I um, I didn't know what to expect exactly. He was in a very good mood that first time because he had been sitting at the coffee sh in the coffee shop at the Hilton with Lori Morgan, country singer Lori Morgan, and her mother. And uh, in the years b before he got Elvis, but after uh, he, he no longer managed Eddie Arnold, he booked Grand Ole Opry stars, and one of those was George Morgan, Laurie's father. And, and uh, so he, he had a soft spot for, for talking to Laurie Morgan and her mom. And so he was in a good mood. He'd been reminiscing. So when I went over, uh, he was pretty jovial, and uh, he invited me to order anything off the menu. And uh, it, was, it was clear, though, that uh, he wasn't going to talk about Elvis. He would talk about almost anything but Elvis. So. I ended up staying about three hours. I had a friend with me because to kind of boost my courage, and we both sat there with him for about three hours. And and um, I, as we left, uh, I, I had forgotten to say to her, he doesn't like to be touched, so so don't touch him. And my friend, his name is Judy May, uh, we're kind of best. We've been best friends since 1986. 
she's a very affectionate person. So as we went to go, she she leaned in to give him a hug, and you know my heart stopped. I thought, oh my god, oh my god, he's going to hate this. But he uh, he seemed to like it, although he joked about it. He said, usually I don't I don't like women to hug me. He said. You know, when I used to go to Chasen's, the Hollywood restaurant, all these women are always coming up and wanting to kiss me, kiss, kiss, and hug, hug. He said, finally, I got these fake warts and blood and put them all over my face. And that stopped the hugging. That stopped the kissing. So <laughs> he was a character. But, you know, because, because I wanted him to cooperate with this book, he was in such a good mood that day. I thought, oh... Maybe this isn't the time to actually ask him, you know, maybe because uh, uh, it, it's it was pretty serious business. So I thought I'll just go home and write him a letter. And now that I've met him and then ask him that way. But to my surprise, early the next morning, about nine o'clock that, that morning, the next morning, he called me in my hotel and uh, to offer me tickets to another show at the Hilton, the, I think the Starlight Express. Now, th that was really interesting because he never asked me where I was staying and we never told him where we were staying. So he tracked me down to do that, uh, which is fascinating in itself. Why, uh, why would he do that? But anyway, during that call, I thought, oh, gosh, you know, he wants us to be friends, but I've got to be completely honest with him about why I'm here. I don't want to misrepresent myself. So I told him I was working on this book with Marty and, and Billy and uh, Lamar. And oh, his tone changed. You know, he was not happy to, to learn that. He said, you know, uh, there are too many Elvis books out there right now. So, uh, you know, he was, he continued to be kind of polite, but I could tell he was disappointed. And uh, then I went home and I wrote to him and uh, I said, you know, this would be a chance for you to set the record straight and present your side of the story. And uh, he wrote me back and he said he didn't need to set the record straight, that he slept good. And uh, um, he didn't understand why everybody just wanted to talk about Elvis. I, I have a, I copied down some of this to read to you. He said in his letter to me, um, let me find this. Um, he said, although Elvis plays a big part in my story, he is only part of it. As my career is with all the artists I was associated with, including elephants, horses, ponies, lions. At one time, I had two lions myself and a small elephant, which I rented out. So, you know, I always, <laughs> I always kind of think uh, seriously, you know, he can't be serious in thinking that Elvis was just part of his career and these other things held sway. But but, uh, you know, I was talking to Greg Geller, and Greg Geller worked for RCA um, in the 80s, and he would go to the Colonel to talk about uh, re-releases. And he told me that um, he, he tried to convince the Colonel to do a spoken word recording for them, for RCA, not about Elvis, because he wouldn't do that, but about the old days on the carnival circuit and uh, 40s and 50s country music. And he said, unfortunately, the colonel had a rather inflated view of what such a record might be worth. So it never happened, which is a shame. But that's what he wanted to talk about whenever Greg would go see him. And very often with me on these three, three hour visits I had with him. He never he really never left the carnival. You know, it was all uh, reminiscing about those early days. Yeah, and that was probably the best days in his life, I guess. That's where yes. he fit in, you know, and he kept that for, for the rest of his life, you know, even he was managing the biggest guy in the world, he still have to, had those carnival uh, people coming around him and they were actually more important than RCA, you know, if they were there, you know. That, that is exactly right. And, uh, you know, I talked to, uh, there's a fellow that I talked to quite a bit for my Colonel Parker biography. And, um, his name was Byron Raphael, and he was a, a junior agent in training. In other words, he was really a mailroom guy at William Morris, but uh, the colonel kind of liked him, and so he had him assigned to the colonel. So William Morris paid his salary, but he was assigned to the colonel, and he literally lived with him at various points. And he said that uh, in the uh, mid, mid, rather the late 50s, uh, 57, mostly 57, 58, he would be driving the colonel across country, and they'd always stay in these kind of out-of-the-way places in these cheap motels. But 
anytime they were ever near where there was some kind of carnival act, uh, the colonel would always say, turn off here. And he'd always take him to all these out of the way places where he would visit with these sideshow performers, including somebody who unfortunately had been kind of like the geek, you know, this kind of pitifully uh, deformed person who uh, somebody with, you know, kind of a tail or a tail glued on, but somebody who clearly had developed mental issues and was in a cage. But, you know, this was enormously important to the colonel to keep those old ties and friendships with his carny past. Yeah, it's amazing. But let's go a little bit back uh, to... Um... Uh, yeah, before we start going all the way back to how the Colonel grew up and, and things like that, we're going to talk a little bit about that. I want to ask you, because uh, Dave Mars, the rock critic, he, in your book, is uh, quoted for saying that he, the Colonel, was the most over, what do you call it, overrated manager ever in music history. Yeah. Your mother, um, who quotes that he was the biggest and most important name yeah. in music history. Uh, where do you find the Colonel? You know, I'm kind of in the middle. Um, it's it's very interesting because I, I looked back recently at some of the interviews I had done with the, uh, the Grand Ole Opry folks and the people in Nashville about him, including Chet Atkins. Uh, because, of course, Chet uh, produced Heartbreak Hotel and, and the Colonel had to deal with him in the early years of Elvis's career. And um, he said to me, Chet Atkins said to me, I admired the Colonel. He had so much brass and know-how to promote an artist. And I think if it hadn't been for him, Elvis would have been forgotten about in a short time. But he made him unavailable to the press and it worked. Everybody wanted to see him. Everybody had to have a piece of him. The Colonel is the best I ever saw as a manager. And, and I asked the same about uh, little Jimmy Dickens, who was not managed by the Colonel, but was booked by the Colonel during the same period I referenced between Eddie Arnold and, and Elvis. And he said he was perfect. Perfect. So uh, the people in Nashville had an awful, awfully high regard of the Colonel. But, but I think certainly in the early days, he was a wonderful manager, but even more than a good manager, a fantastic promoter. He, now, he may have been crude in his techniques, particularly bringing in, you know, remember there was an Elvis Presley midget fan club, which was, you know, just a, a made up thing that uh, the Colonel did with his friend Al Devoren, again, drawing on those carnival years. Um, and he did a lot of things that, you know, we see in the film, which really is true. He had I love Elvis buttons and I hate Elvis buttons. I mean, he covered all the territory. So in those early years, particularly in 1956, 1957, my gosh, it would be hard to find fault with the colonel. You know, he was not, uh, uh, the William Morris Agency was not keen to book Elvis on early television. And in fact, they kind of dragged their heels and they didn't see the potential. Those those television bookers out of the Morris Agency in, in the New York office were put off by Elvis. They thought he was crude and crass and they didn't understand the way he moved and vulgar and just kind of appalled that they were being asked to put him on these highly respectable shows. And so the colonel lost interest and in, in faith in them. And he went to an independent agent named Steve Yates and booked those five appearances on the the Dorsey Brothers show, stage show, and uh, then pretty much read the Morris Agency, the uh, riot act for not acting quick enough. Uh, so there really wasn't a lot of faith uh, in the Morris office about Elvis. But, you know, where he really falls down, of course, is in the movie years and then uh, in working him so hard in Las Vegas, even though the colonel, uh, you know, when my second to, of the third visits with the colonel, he got really mad at me uh, and kept because I questioned the choice of the movies after uh, uh, the, the, the post army period. When he came home, I questioned the colonel's uh, choice of those those film scripts, and of course, the singles were coming from those those uh, soundtracks. Uh, he got really mad at me, uh, and he said that Elvis could have said no to any one of those, but he didn't. 
But the colonel had no vision about that. You know, the colonel, the colonel was a, a now kind of guy, now money. He didn't like to look long range. He didn't have long range plans. And uh, uh, he thought anything he could get in the moment was, was gold and to trust in the moment. But he didn't have a lot of vision for long term. Now, uh, so the movies and working him so hard in Vegas and then on the road, uh, after the movie period ended, that's where you really have to say, yeah, really question a lot of the decisions that the colonel made as yeah, a manager. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is Steve Likes, and I hope you enjoyed this little story. Read more in the book The Colonel, The Extraordinary Story of Colonel Tom Parker and Elvis Presley. Just updated by Alana Nash.